Hi everyone and welcome to lecture 6 of MIT 6S191. This is one of my absolute favorite lectures in the course and we're going to focus and discuss some of the limitations of deep learning algorithms as well as some of the emerging new research frontiers in this field. Before we dive into the technical content, there are some course related and logistical announcements that I'd like to make. The first is that our course has a tradition of designing and delivering t-shirts to students participating. This year we are going to continue to honor that. So to that end, we have a sign-up sheet on Canvas for all students where you can indicate your interest in receiving a t-shirt. And once you fill out that sign-up sheet with the necessary information, we'll ensure that a t-shirt is delivered to you uh, by the appropriate means um, as soon as possible. And if after the class, if the Canvas is closed and you can't access that sign-up form, please just feel free to send us an email and we'll find a way to get the t-shirt to you. So to provide a, take a step back and give an overview of our schedule of this course so far, where we've been and where we're going. Following this lecture on limitations and new frontiers, we'll have the due date for our final software lab on reinforcement learning. Tomorrow we're going to have two really exciting hot topic spotlight lectures with brand new content and that will be followed by a series of four guest lectures. You'll have time over the rest of this week to continue to work on your final projects and the class will conclude on Friday with the student final project presentations and proposal competition as well as our award ceremony. So speaking of those final projects, let's get into some details about those. For those of you taking the course for credit, you have two options to fulfill your grade. The first is a project proposal where you will work in up to a group of four to develop a new and novel deep learning idea or application. And we realized that two weeks is a very short amount of time to come up with and implement a project. So we are certainly going to be taking this into consideration in the judging. Then on Friday, January 29th, you will give a brief three minute presentation on your project proposal to a group of judges who will then award the final prizes. As far as logistics and timelines, you will need to indicate your interest in presenting by this Wednesday at midnight Eastern time, and we'll need to submit the slide for your presentation by midnight Eastern time on Thursday. Instructions for the project proposal and submission of these requirements are on the course syllabus and on the Canvas site. Our top winners are going to be awarded prizes, including NVIDIA GPUs and uh, Google Homes. The key point that I'd like to make about the final proposal presentations is that in order to participate and be eligible for the prize, synchronous attendance is required on Friday's course. So Friday, January 29th, from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern time, you will need to be present your, or your group will need to be present in order to participate in the final proposal um, competition. The second option for fulfilling the credit requirement is to write a one-page review of a deep learning paper, with the evaluation being based on the completeness and clarity of your review. This is going to be due by Thursday midnight Eastern time, and further information and instruction on this is also available on Canvas. So after this lecture, next we're going to have a series of two really exciting hot topic spotlight talks. And these are going to focus on two rapidly emerging and developing areas within deep learning, um, deep learning research. The first is going to highlight a series of approaches called evidential deep learning that seeks to develop algorithms that can actually learn and estimate the uncertainties of neural networks. And the second spotlight talk is going to focus on machine learning bias and fairness. And here we're going to discuss some of the dangers of implementing uh, biased algorithms in society and also emerging strategies to actually mitigate these unwanted biases. That will then be followed by a series of really exciting and awesome guest le lectures from leading researchers in um, industry and academia. And specifically, we're going to have uh, talks that are going to cover a diversity of topics, everything from AI and healthcare to document analysis for business applications and computer vision. And we highly, highly, highly encourage you to join synchronously for these lectures if you can on January 27th and January 28th from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern. These are going to be 
um, highlighting very exciting topics and they may extend a bit into the designated software lab time so that we can ensure we can have a live Q&A with our fantastic guest speakers. All right, so that concludes the logistical and course related announcements. Let's dive into the fun stuff and the technical content for this lecture. So, so far in taking Success 191, I hope that you've gotten a sense of how deep learning has revolutionized and is revolutionizing so many different research areas and fields, from advances in autonomous vehicles, to medicine and healthcare, to reinforcement learning, generative modeling, robotics, and a variety of other applications from natural language processing to finance and security. And alongside with understanding the tremendous application utility and power of deep learning, I hope that you have also established concrete understanding of how these algorithms actually work and how specifically they have enabled these advances. To take a step back at the types of algorithms and models that we've been considering, we've primarily dealt with systems that take as input data as the, in the form of signals, images, other sensory data, and move forward to produce a decision as the output. This can be a prediction, this can be a, a output uh, detection, it can also be an action, as in the case of reinforcement learning. We've also considered the inverse problem, as in the case of generative modeling, where we can actually train neural networks to produce new data instances. And in both these paradigms, we can really think of neural networks as very powerful function approximators. And this relates back to a long-standing theorem in the theory of neural networks, and that's called the Universal Approximation Theorem, and it was presented in 1989 and generated quite the stir in the community. And what this theorem, the Universal Approximation Theorem, states is that a neural network with a single hidden layer is sufficient to approximate any arbitrary function to any arbitrary position. Um, all it requires is a single layer. And in this class, we've primarily dealt with deep neural models, where we are stacking multiple hidden layers on top of each other. But this theorem completely ignores that fact and says, okay, we only need one layer. So long as we can uh, reduce our problem to a set of output, inputs and a set of outputs, this means there has to exist a neural network that can solve this problem. It's a really, really powerful and really big statement. But if you consider this closely, there are a couple of caveats that we have to be aware of. The first is that this theorem makes no guarantees on the number of hidden units or size of the layer that's going to be required to solve such a problem, right? And it also leaves open the question of how we could actually go about training such a model, finding the weights to support that architecture. It doesn't make any claims about that. It just says it proves that one such network exists. But as we know, with gradient descent, finding these weights is highly non-trivial and uh, due to the very non-convex nature of the optimization problem. The other critical caveat is that this theorem places no guarantees on how well the resulting model would actually generalize to other tasks. And indeed, I think that this, this theorem, the universal approximation theorem, points to a broader issue that relates to the possible effects of overhype in artificial intelligence. And us as a community, as students invested in advancing the state of this field, I think we need to be really careful in how we consider and market and advertise these algorithms. While the universal approximation theorem was able to generate a lot of excitement, it also provided a false sense of hope to the community at the time, which was that neural networks could be used to solve any problem. And as you can imagine, this overhype is very, very, very dangerous. And this overhype has also been tied in to what were two historic AI winters, where research in artificial intelligence and neural networks more specifically slowed down very significantly. And I think we're still in this phase of explosive growth, which is why today for the rest of the lecture, I want to focus in on some of the limitations of the algorithms that we've learned about and extend beyond to discuss how we can go beyond this to uh, consider new research frontiers. All right, so first the limitations. One of my favorite and I think one of the most powerful examples of a potential 
uh, danger and limitation of deep neural networks come from this paper called Understanding Deep Neural Networks Requires Rethinking Generalization. And what they did in this paper was a very simple experiment. They took images from the dataset ImageNet, and each of these images are associated with a particular class label, as seen here. And what they did was they did this experiment where for every image in the dataset, not class, but individual images, they flipped a die, a K-sided die, where K was the number of possible classes they were considering. And they used this, this flip of the die to randomly assign a brand new label to a particular image, which meant that these new labels associated were completely random with respect to what was actually present in the image. So for example, a remapping could be visualized here and note that these two instances of dogs have been mapped to different classes altogether. So we're completely randomizing our labels. What they next did was took this data, this scrambled data, and tried to fit a deep neural network to the, uh, to the ImageNet data by applying varying degrees of randomization from the original data with the untouched class labels to the completely randomized um, data. And as you ex may expect, the model's accuracy on the test set, an independent test set, progressively tended to zero as the randomness in the data increased. But what was really interesting was what they observed when they looked at the performance on the training set. And this is what they found. They found that no matter how much they randomized the labels, the model was able to get close to 100% accuracy on the training set. And what this highlights is that in a very similar way to the statement of the universal approximation theorem, it gets at this idea that deep neural networks can perfectly fit to any function, even if that function is associated with entirely random data driven by random labeling. So to dr really drive this point home, I think the best way to consider and understand neural networks is as very, very good function approximators. And all the universal uh, approximation theorem states is that neural networks are very good at this, right? So let's suppose here we have some data points and we can learn using a neural network a function that approximates this, this data. And that's going to be based on sort of a maximum likelihood estimation of the distribution of that data. What this means is that if we give the model a new data point shown here in purple, we can expect that our neural network is going to predict a maximum likelihood estimate for that data point. And that estimate is probably going to lie along this function. But what happens now if I extend beyond this in-distribution region to now out-of-domain regions? Well, there are really no guarantees on what the data looks like in this region, in these regions. And therefore, we can't make any statements about how our model is going to behave or perform in these regions. And this is one of the greatest limitations that exist with modern deep neural networks. So there's a revision here to this statement about neural networks being really excellent function approximators. They're really excellent function approximators when they have training data. And this also raises the question of what happens in these out of distribution regions where the network has not seen training examples before? How do we know when our network doesn't know is not confident in the predictions it's making. Building off this idea, I think there can be this conception that can be amplified and inflated by the media that deep learning is basically alchemy, right? It's this magic cure, it's this be all end all solution that can be applied to any problem. I mean, its power really seems awesome and I'm almost certain that was probably a draw for you to attend and take this course. But you know, if we can say that deep learning algorithms are sort of this be all, all compensating uh, solution that can be applied to any arbitrary problem or application, there's this also resulting idea and belief that you can take some set of training data, apply some network architecture, sort of turn the crank on your learning al algorithm and spit out excellent results. But that's simply not how deep learning works your model is only going to be as good as your data. And as the adage in the community goes, if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. 
I think an example that really highlights this limitation is the one that I'm going to show you now, which emphasizes just how much these neural network systems depend on the data they're trained with. So let's say we have this image of a dog and we're going to pass it into a CNN-based architecture where our goal is to try to train a network to take a black and white image and colorize it. What happened to this image of a dog when it was passed into this model was as follows. Take a cl close look at this result. If you'll notice, under the nose of the dog, there's this pinkish region in its fur, which probably doesn't make much sense, right? If if this was just a natural dog. But why could this be the case? Why could our model be spitting out this result? Well, if we consider the data that may have been used to train the network, it's probably very, very likely that amongst the thousands upon thousands of images of dogs that were used to train such a model, the majority or many of those images would have dogs sticking their tongues out, right? Because that's what dogs do. So the CNN may have mapped that region under the mouth of the dog to be most likely to be pink. So when it saw a dog that had its mouth closed, it didn't have its tongue out, it assumes in a way, right, or its, it's built up representation is such that it's going to map that region to a pink color. And what this highlights is that deep learning models build up representations based on the data they've seen. And I think this is a really critical point. As you go out, you know, you've taken this course and you're interested in applying deep learning perhaps to some applications and problems of interest to you. Your model is always going to be only as good as your data. And this also raises a question of how do neural networks handle data instances where that they have not encountered before? And this I think is highlighted uh, very potently by this infamous and tragic example from a couple years ago, where a car from Tesla that was operating autonomously crashed while operating autonomously, killing the driver. And it turned out that the driver who was the individual killed in that crash had actually reported multiple instances in the weeks leading up to the crash where the car was actually swiveling towards that exact same barrier into which it crashed. Why could it have been doing that? Well, it turned out that the images, which were representative of the data on which the car's autonomous system was trained, the images from that region of the freeway actually lacked new construction that altered the appearance of that barrier, recent construction, such that the car before it crashed, had encountered a data instance that was effectively out of distribution. And it did not know how to handle this situation because it had only seen particular, uh, bear, a particular style and architecture of the barrier in that instance, causing it tragically to crash. And in this instance, it was a, a occurrence where a neural network failure mode resulted in the loss of human life. And this points, these sorts of failure modes points to and motivate the need for really having systematic ways to understand when the predictions from deep learning models cannot be trusted. In other words, when it's uncertain in its predictions. And this is a very exciting and um, important topic of research in deep learning, and it's going to be the focus of our first Spotlight talk. This notion of uncertainty is definitely very important for the deployment of deep learning systems in what I like to think of as safety critical applications. Things like autonomous driving, things like medicine, facial recognition, right? As these algorithms are interfacing more and more with human life, we really need to have principled ways to ensure their robustness. Uncertainty metrics are also very useful in cases where we have to rely on data sets that may be imbalanced or have a lot of no noise in, present in them. And we'll consider these different use cases further in the Spotlight Lecture. All right, so before, as a, as a um, preparation for tomorrow's Spotlight Lecture, I'd like to give a bit of an overview about what uncertainties we need and what uncertainties we can talk about when considering deep learning algorithms. So let's consider this 
classification problem, where we're going to try to build a neural network that models probabilities over a fixed set of classes. So in this case, we're trying to train a neural network on images of cats, images of dogs, and then output whether a new image uh, has a cat or has a dog, right? Keep in mind that um, the probabilities of cat and dog have to sum to one. So what happens when we now train our model, we're ready to test it, and we have an image that contains both a cat and a dog? Still, the network is going to have to output class probabilities that are going to sum to one. But in truth, this image has both a cat and a dog. This is an instance of what we can think about as noise or stochasticity that's present in the data. If we train this model on images of cats alone or dogs alone, a new instance that has both a dog and a cat is noisy with respect to what the, uh, the model has seen before. Uncertainty metrics can help us assess the noise, that's the statistical noise that's inherent in the data and present in the data. And this is called data uncertainty or aleatoric uncertainty. Now let's consider another case. Let's take our same cat-dog classifier and input now an image of a horse to this classifier. Again, the output probabilities are going to have to sum to one, but even if the network is predicting that this image is most likely containing a dog, we would expect that it should really not be very confident in this prediction. And this is an instance where our model is now being tested on an image that's totally out of distribution, an image of a horse. And therefore, we're going to expect that it's not very confident in its prediction. This type of uncertainty is a different type of uncertainty than that data uncertainty. It's called model or epistemic uncertainty, and it reflects how confident a given prediction is. Very, very important for understanding how well neural networks gener generalize to out of distribution regions and how they can report on their performance in out of distribution regions. And in the Spotlight lecture, you'll really take a deep dive into these ideas of uncertainty estimation and explore some emergent approaches to actually learn neural network uncertainties directly. The third failure mode I'd like to consider is one that I think is super fun and also in a way kind of scary. And that's this idea of adversarial examples. The idea here is we take some input example. For example, this image of a temple and a standard CNN trained on you know, a set of images, is going to classify this particular image as a temple with 97% probability. We then take that image and we apply some particular perturbations to that image to generate what we call an adversarial example, such that if we now feed this perturbed example to that same CNN, it no longer recognizes that image as a temple. Instead, it incorrectly classifies this image as an ostrich, which is kind of mind-boggling, right? So what was it about this perturbation that actually achieved this complete adversarial attack? What is this perturbation doing? Remember that when we train neural networks using gradient descent, our, our task is to take some objective, J, and try to um, optimize that objective given a set of weights, W, and input X and a prediction Y. And our goal and what we're asking in doing this gradient descent update is how does a small change in the weights decrease the loss? Specifically, how can we perturb these weights in order to minimize the loss, the objective we're seeking to minimize? In order to do so, we train the network with a fixed image X and a true label Y and perturb only the weights to minimize the loss. With adversarial attacks, we're now asking how can we modify the input image in order to increase the error in the network's prediction. Therefore, we're trying to predict uh, to perturb the input X in some way such that when we fix the set of weights W and the true label Y, we can then increase the loss function to basically trip the network up, make it make a mistake. 
This idea of adversarial perturbation was recently extended by a group here at MIT that devised an algorithm that could actually uh, synthesize adversarial examples that were adversarial over any set of transformations like rotations or color changes. And they were able to synthesize a set of 2D adversarial attacks that were quite robust to these types of transformations. What was really cool was they took this a step further to go beyond 2D images to actually synthesize physical objects, 3D objects, that could then be used to fool neural networks. And this was the first demonstration of uh, adversarial examples that actually existed in the real physical world. So the example here, these turtles that were 3D printed adversarial to be adversarial were incorrectly classified as rifles when images of those turtles were taken. Again, these are real physical objects. And those images were then fed into a uh, classifier. So a lot of interesting questions raised um, in terms of what, how can we guarantee the robustness and safety of deep learning algorithms to such adversarial attacks, which can be used perhaps maliciously to try to perturb uh, the systems that depend on deep learning algorithms. The final limitation but cert that I'd like to introduce in this lecture, but certainly not the final li limitation of deep learning overall, is that of algorithmic bias. And this is a topic and an issue that deservingly so has gotten a lot of attention recently. And it's going to also be the focus of our second hot topic lecture. And this idea of algorithmic bias is centered around the fact that neural network models and AI systems more broadly are very susceptible to significant biases resulting from the way they're built, the way they're trained, the data they're trained on. And critically, that these biases can lead to very real detrimental societal consequences. So we'll discuss this issue in tomorrow's uh, Spotlight Talk, which should be very exciting. So these are just some of many of the uh, limitations of neural networks. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list. And I'm very excited to, again, uh, re-emphasize that we're going to focus in on two of these limitations, uncertainty and algorithmic bias, in our next two upcoming Spotlight Talks. All right, for the remainder of this talk, this lecture, I want to focus on some of the really exciting new frontiers of deep learning that are being targeted towards tackling some of these limitations. Specifically, this problem of neural networks being treated as like black box systems that uh, lack sort of domain knowledge and structure and prior knowledge. And finally, the broader question of how do we actually design neural networks from scratch? Does it require expert knowledge? And what can be done to create more generalizable pipelines for machine learning more broadly. All right, the first new frontier that we'll delve into is how we can encode structure and domain knowledge into deep learning architectures. To take a step back, we've actually already seen sort of an example of this in our study of convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks, CNNs, were inspired by the way that visual processing is thought to work in, in the brain. And CNNs were introduced to try to capture spatial dependencies in data. And the idea that was key to enabling this was the convolution operation. And we saw and we discussed how we could use convolution to extract local features present in the data and how we can uh, apply different sets of filters to determine different features and maintain spatial invariance across uh, spatial data. This is a key example of how the structure of the problem, image data being defined spatially, inspired and led to a advance in encoding structure into a neural network architecture to really tune that architecture specifically for that problem and or class of problems of interest. Moving beyond image data or sequence data, the truth is that all around us, there are, there are data sets and data problems that have irregular structures. In fact, there can be a, um, the paradigm of graphs and of networks 
is one where there's a very, very high degree of rich structural information that can be encoded in a graph or a network that's likely very important to the problem that's being considered. But it's not necessarily clear how we can build a neural network architecture that could be well suited to operate on data that is represented as a graph. So what types of data or what types of examples could lead naturally to a representation as a graph? Well, one that we're all too immersed in and familiar with is that of social networks. Beyond this, you can think of state machines, which define uh, transitions between different states in a system as being able to be represented by a graph, or patterns of human, human mobility, transportation, chemical molecules, where you can uh, think of the, the individual atoms in the molecule as nodes in the graph connected by the bonds that connect those atoms, biological networks. And the commonality to all these instances and graphs as a structure more broadly is driven by this uh, appreciation for the fact that there are so many real-world data examples and applications where there is a structure that can't be readily captured by a, simple, a simpler data encoding like an image or a temporal sequence. And so we're going to talk a little bit about graphs as a structure that can uh, provide a new and non-standard encoding for a series of, of, of problems. All right. To see how we can do this and to build up that understanding, let's go back to a network architecture that we've seen before, we're familiar with, the CNN. And as you probably know, and I hope you know by now, in CNNs, we have this uh, convolutional kernel. And the way the convolutional operation in CNN layers works is that we slide this rectangular kernel over our input image such that the kernel can pick up on what is inside. And this operation is driven by that element-wise multiplication and addition that we reviewed previously. So stepping through this, if you have an image, right, the, the convolutional kernel is effectively sliding across the image, applying its filter, its set of weights to the image, going on um, doing this repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly across the entirety of the image. And the idea behind CNNs is by designing these filters according to particular sets of weights, we can pick up on different types of features that are present in the data. Graph convolutional networks operate on a very, using a very similar idea, but now instead of operating on a 2D image, the network is operating on data that's represented as a graph, where the graph is defined by nodes, shown here in circles, and edges, shown here in lines. And those edges define relationships between the nodes in the graph. The idea of, of how we can extract information from this graph is very similar in principle to what we saw with CNNs. We're going to take a kernel. Again, it's just a weight matrix. And rather than sliding that kernel across the 2D, uh, the 2D matrix representation of our image, that kernel is going to pop around and travel around to different nodes in the graph. And as it does so, it's going to look at the local neighborhood of that node and pick up on features relevant to the local connectivity of that node within the graph. And so this is the graph convolution operation where we now learn to, uh, the, the network learns to define the weights associated with that filter that capture the edge dependencies um, present in the graph. So let's step th through this. That weight kernel is going to go around to different nodes and it's going to look at its emergent neighbors. The graph convolutional operator is going to associate then weights with each of the edges present and is going to apply those weights across the graph. So the kernel is then going to be moved to the next node in the graph, extracting information about its local connectivity, so on, applying to all the different nodes in the graph. And the key as we uh, continue this operation, is that that local information is going to be aggregated, and the neural network is going to then learn a function that encodes that local information into a higher level representation. So that's a very um, brief and intuitive introduction, hopefully, about graph convolutional neural networks, how they operate in principle. And it's a really, really exciting network architecture, which has now 
been enabling enormously powerful advances in a variety of scientific domains. For example, in chemical uh, sciences and in molecular discovery, there are a class of graph neural networks called message passing networks, which ha have been very successfully deployed on 2D, two-dimensional graph-based representations of chemical structures. And these message passing networks build up a learned representation of the atomic and chemical um, bonds and relationships that are present in a chemical structure. These same networks, based on graph uh, neural networks, were very recently applied to discover a novel antibiotic, a novel drug that was effective at killing uh, resistant bacteria in animal models of bacterial infection. I think this is an extremely exciting avenue for research as we start to see uh, these deep learning systems and neural network architectures being applied within the biomedical domain. Another recent and very exciting application area is in mobility and in traffic prediction. So here we can take streets, represent them as, break them up to represent them as nodes, and model the intersections and the regions of the street network via graph, where the nodes and edges define the network of connectivity. And what teams have done is to build up this graph neural network representation to learn how to predict traffic patterns across road systems. And in fact, this modeling can result in improvements in how well estimated time of arrivals can be predicted uh, in things and interfaces like Google Maps. Another very recent and highly relevant example of graph neural networks is in forecasting the spread of COVID-19 disease. And there have been groups that have looked into incorporating both geographic data, so information about where a person lives and is located, who they may be connected to, as well as temporal data, information about that individual's movement and trajectory over time, and using this as the input to graph neural networks. And because of the spatial and temporal component to this data, what has been done is that the graph neural networks have been integrated with temporal embedding components such that they can learn to forecast the spread of the COVID-19 disease based not only on spatial geographic connections and proximities, but also on temporal patterns. Another class of data that we may encounter is that of three-dimensional data, three-dimensional sets of points, which are often referred to as point clouds. And this is another domain in which the same idea of graph neural networks is um, enabling a lot of powerful advances. So to appreciate this, you will first have to understand what exactly these three-dimensional data sets look like. These point clouds are effectively unordered sets of data points in space, a cloud of points, where there is some underlying spatial dependence between the points. So you can imagine having these sort of point-based uh, representations of a three-dimensional structure of an object, and then training a neural network on these data to do many of the same types of, of tasks and problems that we saw in our computer vision lecture. So classification, taking a point cloud, identifying that as an object, as a particular object. Segmentation, taking a point cloud, uh, segmenting out instances of that point cloud that belong to particular objects or particular um, content types. We, what we can do is we can extend graph convolutional networks to be able to operate to point clouds. The way that's done, which I think is super awesome, is by taking a point cloud, expanding it out, and dynamically computing a graph using the meshes inherent in the point cloud. And this is, example is shown with this, this uh, structure of a rabbit, where we're starting here from the point cloud, expanding out, and then defining the local connectivity uh, across this 3D mesh. And therefore, we can then apply graph convolutional networks to sort of maintain invariances about the order of points um, in 3D space and also still capture the local geometries of such a data system. All right, so hopefully that gives you a sense of 
different types of ways we can start to think about encoding structure into neural, neural network architectures, moving beyond the uh, architectures that we saw in the first five lectures. For the second new frontier that I'd like to focus on and discuss in the remainder of this talk, it's this idea of how we can learn to learn. And I think this is a very powerful um, and thought-provoking domain within deep learning research. And it spawns some interesting questions about how far and how deep we can push the capabilities of machine learning and AI systems. The motivation behind this field of what is now called automated machine learning or auto ML is the fact that standard deep neural network architectures are optimized for performance on a single task. And in order to build a new model, we require sort of domain expertise, expert knowledge, to try to define a new architecture that's going to be very well suited for a particular task. The idea behind automated machine learning is that can we go beyond this, this tuning of, of you know, optimizing a particular architecture robustly for a single task? Can we go beyond this to build broader algorithms that can actually learn what are the best models to use to solve a given problem? And what we mean in terms of best model or which model to use is that its architecture is optimal for that problem. The hyperparameters associated with that architecture, like the number of layers it has, the number of neurons per layer, those are also optimized. And this whole system is built up and learned via an a, a algorithm. This is the idea of AutoML. And in the original AutoML work, which stands for Automated Machine Learning, the original work used a framework based on reinforcement learning, where there was a, um, a neural network that is referred to as a controller. And in this case, this con controller network is a recurrent neural network. The controller, what it does, is it proposes a sample model architecture, what's called the child architecture. And that architecture is going to be defined by a set of hyperparameters. That resulting architecture is, can then be trained and evaluated for its performance on a particular task of interest. The feedback of the performance of that child network is then used as sort of the reward in this re reinforcement learning framework to try to promote and inform the controller as to how to actually improve its network proposals for the next round of optimization. So this cyclic process is repeated thousands upon thousands of times, generating new architectures, testing them, giving that feedback to the controller to build and learn from. And eventually the controller is going to tend towards assigning high probabilities to hyperparameters and regions of the architecture search space that achieve higher accuracies on the problem of interest and will assign low probability to those areas of the search space that perform poorly. So how does this agent, how does this controller agent actually work? Well, at the broad view, at the macro scale, it's going to be a RNN-based architecture where at each step, each iteration of this pipeline, the model is this controller model is going to sample a brand new network architecture. And that this controller network is specifically going to be optimized to predict the hyperparameters associated with that spawned child network. So for example, we can consider the optimization of a particular layer. That optimization is going to involve prediction of hyperparameters associated with that layer, like as for a convolutional layer, the size of the filter, the length of the stride, and so on and so forth. Then that resulting network, that child network that's spawned and defined by these predicted hyperparameters is going to be tested, trained and tested, such that after evaluation, we can take the resulting accuracy and update the recurrent neural network controller system based on how well the child network performed on our task. That RNN controller 
can then learn to create an even better model. And this fits very nicely into the reinforcement learning framework where the agent of our controller network is going to be uh, rewarded and updated based on the performance of the child network that it spawns. This idea has now been extended to a number of different domains. For example, uh, recently in the context of image recognition, where the same principle of a controller network that spawns a child network that's then tested, evaluated to improve the controller, was used to uh, design a optimized neural network for the task of image recognition. And this paradigm of designing this designing an architecture can be thought of as neural architecture search. And in this work, the controller system was used to construct um, and design convolutional layers that were used in an overall architecture tested on image recognition tasks. This diagram here on the left depicts what that learned architecture of a convolutional cell and a convolutional layer actually looked like. And what was really, really remarkable about this work was when they evaluated, was the results that um, they found when they evaluated the performance of these neural network designed neural networks. I know that's kind of a mouthful, but let's consider those results. So first here in black, I'm showing the accuracy of the state of the art human designed convolutional models on an image recognition task. And as you can appreciate, the accuracy shown on the y-axis scales with the number of parameters in the millions shown on the x-axis. What was striking was when they compared the performance of these human designed models to the models spawned and returned by the AutoML algorithm, shown here in red. These neural designed neural architectures achieved superior accuracy compared to the human designed uh, systems with relatively fewer parameters. This idea of using machine learning, using deep learning to then learn more general systems or more general paradigms for uh, predictive modeling and decision making is a very, very powerful one. And most recently, there's now been a lot of emerging interest in moving beyond auto ML and neural architecture search to what we can think of more broadly as auto AI an automated complete pipeline for designing and deploying machine learning and AI models, which starts from data curation, data pre-processing, to model selection and design, and finally to deployment. And the idea here is that perhaps we can build a generalizable pipeline that can facilitate and automatically uh, accelerate and design all steps of this process. I think this idea spawns a very, very thought-provoking point, which is, can we build AI systems that are capable of generating new ne neural networks designed for specific tasks, but the higher order AI system that's built is then sort of learning beyond a specific task? Not only does this reduce the need for us as experienced engineers to try to uh, hand design and optimize these networks, it also makes these deep learning algorithms more accessible. And more broadly, we start to get at this consideration of what it means to be creative, what it means to be intelligent. And when Alexander introduced this course, he spoke a little bit about his thoughts on what intelligence means. The ability to take information, using it to inform a future decision. And as humans, our learning pipeline is definitely not restricted to optimization for a, a very specific task. Our ability to learn and achieve and solve problems impacts our ability to learn completely separate problems our, and improves our analytical abilities. The models and the neural network algorithms that exist today are certainly not able to extend to this point and to capture this phenomena of generalizability. And I think in order to re reach the point of true artificial intelligence, we need to be considerate of what that true generalizability and problem solving capability means. And I encourage you to think about this, this point, to think about how AutoML, how AutoAI, 
how deep learning more broadly falls into this broader picture of the intersection and the interface between artificial and human intelligence. So I'm going to leave you with that as a point of reflection for you at this point in the course and beyond. With that, um, I'm going to close this lecture and remind you that we're going to have a, a software lab and office hour session. We're going to be focusing on um, providing support for you to finish the final lab on reinforcement learning, but you're always welcome to come discuss with us, ask your questions, discuss with your classmates and teammates. And for that, we encourage you to come to the class gather town, and uh, I hope to see you there. Thank you so much.